So good afternoon, and uh, thank you for coming, thank you for listening, or uh, just resting your feet, I don't mind. Uh, my name is Alistair Chapman. I'm, you can probably tell by my accent, I'm not local. I'm from the UK, and I'm a DOP cinematographer, and I do all kinds of things. I've been working in uh, broadcast television for over 20 years. I produce uh, corporate videos, uh, TV productions, I do a lot of documentary productions for National Geographic, for Discovery Channel. And I also am in Europe a Sony ICE, that's an independent certified expert. So I uh, do training, uh, workflow uh, guides, courses, things like that for people that are using the cameras that I use myself. And you can find lots more about me, lots more about these cameras on my website, shameless plug, xdcam-user.com. So these are some of the things that I shoot, uh, all kinds of things uh, from hurricanes and tornadoes, the northern lights, uh, short films, TV commercials, and things like that. This uh, footage here for this tornado that was shot uh, last year over here in the US, and that was a, an F4 tornado, did a lot of damage, a very violent tornado. Here we've got uh, my F5 up in Arctic Norway shooting the northern lights. So rather than talk about it uh, f any further, I'm just going to come out of my PowerPoint presentation here and go to uh, Video Player, and we'll have a quick look at some of the, uh, just a compilation of some footage that I've shot with my PMW F5. <laughs> So one of the great things about the F5 is its versatility. As you saw there, a huge range of different subject matters, different types of uh, filming situations, some very controlled, some much less controlled. And the F5, F55 cameras, they just cope with it. And in recent times, the F55 in particular is being adopted more and more as a film, as a camera for movies and very high-end, very high-quality productions. And these are just some of the movies that have sh been shot with the F5. Also for television, 
lots and lots of use of the F-55 uh, in television. Uh, in particular, the Marco Polo series that uh, Netflix have been uh, producing is absolutely stunning. And they had used this camera for these productions because it's compact, it's lightweight, because it's very adaptable, and it produces really amazing uh, picture quality. Now, as you saw in those clips I just showed you, I've taken my camera to all kinds of locations. I've taken it up to Norway in the winter, and the coldest that my F55, my F5 have experienced is minus 43 Fahrenheit, and that was in January of last year. Uh, up there this year, again with it, it was about minus 35, not quite so cold. Uh, hottest, 115 in the shade in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I don't know what the temperature was in the sun. There's certainly the body of the camera was really hot to the touch, but no problem at all. It carried on working just fine. And then Myanmar, um, last year, uh, 102 uh, Fahrenheit, 100% humidity, really, really hot, humid conditions. And the camera has never let me down. So it's a really good, solid, reliable camera. But what really makes it stand out from all the other cameras that are on the market? Well, you have a compact ergonomic design. It's a really small camera. The camera body is just this section here. And that makes it really easy to transport. So I've been doing some filming here at the show. I have my, F50, my F5 with me. And the whole camera, the camera, the viewfinder, the raw recorder, shoulder mount, and a lens goes in a standard carry-on bag that you can get on any aircraft, any airline will take it. So it makes transporting it, getting it for around the world to different countries really, really easy. Amazing image quality. I mean, that goes without saying these days. 4K camera, great sensor, very good sensor technology. And we'll look at that sensor technology a little bit in a minute. Um, so you have a great picture. But one of the key things for me that really makes the F5 and F55 stand out from the crowd is the way it shoots RAW. The RAW recorder, the R5 RAW recorder, docks directly onto the back of the camera. So it's not like having a separate external recorder. There's no wires, there's no cables, and it's all controlled from the same menu system. So it's really easy to use and very simple. And of course, you can shoot RAW and compressed at the same time. And that's a really great bonus, especially when I'm doing the storm footage because it means I have the raw material for my archive and my stock footage sales, and then I have the compressed recording, which I could use XDCAM, MPEG-2, really small codec, that I can deliver directly to broadcasters for breaking news stories, really easy, really simple. Um, so you have multiple codec choices, and we'll look at those codec choices in a bit. Slow motion up to 240 frames per second with the raw recorder, 180 frames per second internally. So very versatile, allows you to uh, slow down time and catch things that you wouldn't perhaps normally see. You also have time lapse, and you saw lots of examples of time lapse in the clip there, so it's a very useful feature, makes the camera versatile. We have the ENG shoulder kit that you can see here. We'll look at that in a moment. And you also have very low power consumption. A lot of the cameras on the market today that shoot 4K, that shoot RAW, um, take a lot of power. So you need big batteries. That means lots of battery chargers and things like that. If you travel a lot, if you're traveling around the world on aircraft, carrying batteries on planes now is a huge problem because you can't put lithium ion batteries in the hold of a passenger aircraft. So you've got to take your batteries on board as carry on. And if you need lots and lots of big batteries, that becomes a major problem. With this camera, with the standard Sony battery, or I have the, um, the new PAG batteries, a 96 watt hour battery will run the camera for around about two hours. So it's a really economical camera to run in terms of power. We also have this wonderful quick change lens mount, just a twist of the, the ring here, and we can change that and put lots of different lenses on. Now, how is this um, all possible, really, with this one camera? Well, the modular design allows us to put on lots of accessories, like the raw recorder, like the shoulder mount. And one of the things on the back of the camera body, if you've got one, you'll know about this, there is a data bus connector big multi-pin connector that gives you access to the camera's data bus and direct access to all the processors and everything else in the camera. So that means that it's very easy to build add-ons to the camera like the raw recorder and like the shoulder mount because they can directly interface with the processors in the camera 
and it really then allows you to drive that accessory from the main menu system of the camera. And that makes it really easy to upgrade, really easy to add things to it. Internally as well, it's modular. So one of the things that, that Sony did uh, fairly recently was they actually added extra codecs to the cameras. They added the uh, DNX HD and Avid ProRes cameras to the codecs to the camera internally. And they were able to do that because of the modular design of the camera. And many of the updates that this camera's had over the years have come based on user feedback. So one of the things that was requested by us, camera owners and operators, was interval record. So Sony went away, they changed the firmware, and it was added to the camera because the users, us, we requested it. Now, when you're shooting, image quality always starts, well, first of all, it starts with the lens. Um, obviously, if you've got a, a poor lens, doesn't matter what you put behind that lens, you're not going to get a great picture. But the next most important thing, of course, is the sensor. And if we want good dynamic range, we need a really good sensor. And Sony have been making sensors for a long, long time, so they really know how to do it. So the F5 and 55, they have 14 stops of dynamic range. Very low noise and very accurate color, especially on the F55. And a really unique feature of these cameras is on the F55 is what Sony call frame image scanning that's more commonly known as a global shutter. And that completely eliminates all the usual CMOS artifacts such as skew and rolling shutter that the majority of CMOS sensors have. And this is a sensor designed and is dedicated as a video production sensor. Some of the other cameras on the market have sensors that have come from industrial applications, and you'll find that they tend to have a lot of fixed pattern noise, whereas this camera is very good, very clean, very low noise. The F55 also shares the same color filters as the F65, and the quality of the color filters is really important because it allows you to get um, better color separation, and it also allows you to get a wider color gamut. So with this wide color gamut, this diagram represents the visible spectrum. It's a bit of a cheat because we have limitations with the projector and things like that. But this gives you an idea of what the camera can actually capture. So this is a whole thing is visible light, visible spectrum. Down here, this gray triangle, this small gray triangle, this is ITU Rec 709. And this is what all our displays that we're using today, or the majority of displays, uh, use. So your normal TV at home, most of your production monitors in your edit suites are all tied to 709. It's actually a very small color gamut. Then beyond this, we have DCI P3. This is the standard used for digital cinema. And you can see that's bigger than for TV. So you get better colors in the cinema. We have print film as well, the red one. And then beyond that, way, way out there, we have the F65 and F55 color gamut. It really is very, very big. And what that means is it doesn't matter whether you're producing for DCI, for the cinema, for 709, you have that huge color range. Also, and this is really important, that the camera is ready for both HDR, high dynamic range uh, display, and Rec 2020, the standard that's coming in the near future for television. And it's one of the few cameras that actually exceeds Rec 2020. So it's a very future-proof camera, the F55. Um, HDR, if you haven't seen the demo yet, you really need to go and see it because it's quite, quite amazing. Now, one of the things to understand about color and this color gamut and these diagrams is color gamut can be one of two things. It can be the recording gamut. So that's the size of the bucket within the camera. How much can we record? And then the other aspect to gamut is how much can the sensor actually see? And they are two very different and very separate things. So if we think of the recording gamut as a bucket, and then you think of the sensor as a scoop, if that sensor isn't good enough, if that scoop isn't big enough, it's not going to fill the bucket. The F55 is one of the few cameras on the market right now that can actually fill this big recording color gamut. Many cameras out there on the market cannot fill that recording gamut. They may be sold and marketed as having um, a big color gamut, something like S gamut, but the sensor itself, because of the color filters used, can't actually fill that. So in effect, you're wasting a lot of data. Your bucket is only half full. 
Um, doesn't mean you say mean you won't get good image quality, but it m does mean that you're not getting what the F55 can deliver. And a general note, one thing, when you're looking at cameras on a monitor, because the monitor more than likely is going to be 709 based, if you show a large gamut on a conventional monitor, the pictures will look flat and washed out. That is to be expected. So don't be surprised when you look at a very large gamut camera to see what looks like washed out pictures. And that's because the camera's gamut is incompatible with the display gamut. So you just need to be aware of that. Now HDR touched on this briefly already. So new monitor and TV and cinema technology is emerging now that allows us to show much greater dynamic ranges. Rec. 709, the technology that we've been tied into for a long time now is based on 50-year-old technology and it's basically based on the limitations of cathode ray tube televisions. And they had an incredibly limited dynamic range and an even more limited color range, which is why that Rec. 709 gamut is so small. Now, as you can see here on the Sony booth, if you, after this presentation, go and have a look at the HDR demo, we can now show these much greater dynamic ranges. 709 is six stops, very limited. We're now able to show around about 14 stops of dynamic range, something in that region anyway, on these new monitors, these new displays. And part of that comes from OLED technology because OLED, when it's off, is black. It's not outputting any light whatsoever. So black is totally black. And because it's actually a light emitting device, when it's on and when it's fully on, it can be very bright. So you can have blacks that are truly black and incredibly bright highlights at the same time that gives you incredible dynamic range. So new standards are going to be required for this. This is all very, very new. There is no set standard for HDR just yet, but it's coming and it's coming very, very fast. Now it is going to need new ways of shooting and in particular new post-production methods because you're going to have to grade your production very differently. Now if you do look at the HDR demo that's being shown here, the footage being shown was shot on either the F65 or the 55. And more or less what's happening is you're taking the S-log recording from the camera and displaying it directly on the monitor. Now anybody that's looked at log on a normal TV, what do you see? a flat washed out picture because the TV is not compatible with S-Log. The TV is 709, the camera is S-Log. This new X300 has S-Log, S-Gamut in it. So now we are directly compatible. The monitor is finally compatible with this wonderful camera that we've got. So finally, and it's really exciting for me, it's the first time in two years I've actually been able to see how good the quality of the camera is because finally we have a monitor that can show it. So do go and have a look at the HDR demo. Unfortunately, I can't show you it on this screen because it's a seven stop, a six stop Rec. 709 screen. But things to look out for when you look at the demo is flames and fire and things like that. You see so much more detail in the flames and the flames really do flicker. Water looks incredible. It really sparkles. It's really impressive. Interesting announcement this morning, Amazon have said that they will be showing HDR via Amazon Prime this year, by the end of 2015. And Netflix lists all productions for Netflix being shot in 4K RAW so that they are ready for HDR. This is happening now. This is not for the future, because one of the great things about HDR is it doesn't actually require any more bandwidth to deliver it. So it's really easy, especially for online delivery organizations, to switch to HDR, and it's a, it's a really amazing image. It will take your breath away. Now, coming back to the camera, many choices of codecs. So how are we going to record this stuff? Well, we have XAVC, 10-bit, 422, in HD, Ultra HD, 2K, and 4K. Really good codec. Just a little note here about codecs. Um, the camera codec is hardware. It's very good. It's in the camera. When you're editing your footage, you're generally going to be using some form of software decoder to decode that footage. XAVC is the new kid on the town, and it's actually taking a little while for some of those software decoders to catch up. The, um, Adobe and, um, who else is it? Ad I believe it's FCP, have now got a new SDK software development kit from Sony, and we should see some improvements in the image quality 
thanks to better decoding of XAVC in Premiere and software like that in the near future. So hopefully it's going to look even better than it already does. We also have legacy codecs. We have MPEG-2 HD, the old XDCAM codec. So if you're producing for news or for a broadcaster, it's more than likely that they'll be able to accept that codec. It's a very, very widely adopted codec, been around for many years now. It's small, it's compact, still gives good image quality, really easy to handle and work with. You have SSTP. This is the same codec, basically, as HDCAM SR. Stunning high-quality codec, really exceptionally good. And it's particularly good for green screen and chroma key work with the F55 and 5 if you use SSTP 444 RGB. Really very good for chroma key. In addition, as an option, you can have ProRes HD, and that can be 12-bit, uh, 444, uh, 42HQ, and 422 as well as AVID compatible DNX HD 10-bit at 185, sorry, at 220 and 145 megabits per second. So you can have all of these codecs inside the camera. No external boxes, no add-ons. It's all there. It's all internal to the camera. And I don't think there's another camera on the market that has as many choices of codecs as the F5 and 55. Now, on top of the codecs and compressed recording, you also have the ability to shoot 16-bit linear RAW. Now, this is where it gets really interesting, in my opinion. Log capture, capturing with gamma, conventional ways of capturing, almost always throw away some highlight information. The way we see the world as human beings, we tend to ignore highlights. If you go outside on a bright, sunny day, how many of you stare at the sky? Very few. You're going to be looking at your, your colleagues that you're with or the plants or the trees or the roads or the cars. You won't be looking up into that really bright sky. We tend to ignore highlights. What's important to us is mid-tones and the mid-range. So one of the ways to make files smaller for traditional recording is to throw away data in the highlights. Um, S-Log, for example... Uh, records each stop of exposure using a roughly the same amount of data. Now, anybody that knows anything about exposure will know that as you go up in f-stops, every time you add another f-stop to your exposure, let's say you wanted to increase the amount of light in your scene by one stop, you'd have to double the amount of light. So every stop you go up your exposure range actually contains twice as much brightness information as the previous one. But S-Log is only using the same amount of data per stop to record. So as you're going brighter and brighter and brighter, relative to the scene that you're shooting, you're using less and less data. Now, most of the time, that's perfectly acceptable, and that works really well because it mimics the way we see the world. But when you start grading a lot or pushing your exposure, that can become a challenge. Now, RAW, when you record RAW, RAW can be either log or linear. So RAW isn't always linear. It can be log, and if it's log RAW, you have this same um, thing with the highlight data, some data is being lost. But Sony's RAW in the F5 and 55 is linear. So all the information in the highlights is retained, and that becomes really important. You'll see how much of a difference this makes in a minute. Sony's RAW is also compressed very lightly, 3 to 1. It's visually lossless. I've never, ever seen a com uh, compression artifact in any of my RAW material. And RAW is also inherently efficient. I'll look at that in a moment. Basically, though, at 24 frames per second, you're going to be running at a bit rate with RAW using the Sony RAW recorder of around about 960 megabits per second. Or you get one hour on a single 512 gigabyte card. Now, yes, it is a lot of data. I'm not going to pretend it's only a small bit of data. It's still quite a lot. But it's actually less than uncompressed HD. Uncompressed HD runs at about 1.2 gigabits per second. So 4K RAW, 24 frames per second, gives you smaller files than uncompressed HD. So don't be too afraid of going to RAW. Now, when you're using a Bayer sensor, and all these large sensor cameras use Bayer, um, you typically have something like 4096 by 2160 pixels. When we record RAW, what we're doing is we are recording 
the raw data from the sensor. We're just recording each of those pixels as it is. We're not processing it, we're not doing anything with it, we're just recording directly what comes off that sensor. So all we're recording is 4096 by 2160 pixels of information. That's it. With a conventional camera, what happens is you take those 4096 by 2160 pixels, you debayer it, you process it, and you turn it into an either RGB or a component Y PBPR signal. And that makes your data three times bigger. So RAW is already inherently efficient because you do that processing, turning it into RGB or component in post or on your computer. So the file doesn't get bigger until you get it back to the edit suite. So it stays nice and small, makes it easy to manage. So RAW is inherently efficient, and that's one of the reasons why it's actually quite usable. Now, Linear RAW gives us the greatest possible post-production flexibility because we're not throwing anything away. We're retaining all of our highlight information. We can also change our white balance in post because we're just taking that raw sensor data. We can adjust our gain in post. We can do all of the stuff that we would often do in the camera in post-production where we have more time, we have better monitors, and it's easier to make a sensible judgment. It's also highly compatible with ACES. Now, ACES is the Academy of Motion Picture um, workflow, and that is also based on linear uh, editing. So when you go into ACES, whether you shot in log or shot with conventional gamma, it gets converted to raw, or sorry, not to raw, to linear, because linear is much easier to grade than log. Grading log is inherently quite difficult. Because log is not linear, because the, it has a curve, when you grade it, you make a small change to the shadows, you get a big change to the highlights. You make a small change to the highlights and you get a tiny change in the shadows. It makes it hard to grade. It's not uh, intuitive. Raw, which is linear, uses linear correction. So you make a small change to the shadows, you get exactly the same corresponding change to the highlights. So it actually makes grading more intuitive and it makes it much easier. And I'll show you a little demonstration of this in a minute. So when you're grading raw, a linear gain change will change your brightness of the whole scene, but grading with log, it does not. Um, with log, if you have different exposures, really the easiest way and the best way to grade is actually with different LUTs, and each LUT will have an offset for each exposure. Just coming back to ACES for a minute, and this is why ACES internally is linear. By converting your log to linear, the grading is easier, it's more intuitive because everything's taking place in that linear space. And then ACES, you don't need lookup tables with ACES because ACES takes care of it. It gives you a very film-like output and there's different uh, types of output. And also from ACES, you can produce multiple masters very quickly. So if you're doing an SDR version, standard dynamic range, and an HDR version, ACES will take care of a lot of that kind of thing for you. So. Grading a 14-stop camera? Well, grading a 14-stop camera is actually going to be a little bit different to a conventional camera. You have a lot more dynamic range, and the way the highlights roll off when you have 14 stops of dynamic range is quite different to a conventional camera. So one of the things that you need to do when you're shooting is to shoot a bit brighter to avoid having too much noise in your shadows, because that's going to affect your grading. Now, just looking at S log for a minute, coming back to log. There's two types of log in the F5 and 55, S log 2 and S log 3. They both provide exactly the same dynamic range. There are small differences in the way the data is distributed or over the curve, but in most cases it doesn't make a great deal of difference to the end result. But the thing about S log 3 is, although it's log, it's what we would call a straight line curve. Now, that sounds a really silly thing or strange thing to say when we're talking about curves. If we look at the blue curve here, which is S log 2, you see it's all curved. There's a big, big curve here, and that makes grading difficult because a small change here results in a big change here. And it's very different the way the shadows handle in the grade to the highlights. If we look at the S log 3 curve, the red line, you'll see that from around about here and upwards, it's actually a straight line. It's a truly log curve.
curve. It's actually plotted on a log scale, so you end up with a straight line. And that actually means that in grading, it's easier to grade than S-log2. It's part of the reason why S-log3 was developed. A lot of people had problems grading S-log2. They found it difficult. S-log3 is much easier, much more straightforward to grade. Now, stylized grading, whenever you're creating a really stylized look with your footage, is generally really hard on your footage because uh, very often with a movie look, you're pulling the blacks down, stretching the mids up, uh, maybe compressing your whites a bit as well, and that tends to bring out any noise in your image. So one of the things when you're shooting with a high dynamic range camera like an F55 or 5 is that you can actually deliberately overexpose the camera this improves the signal to noise ratio of the camera because you're letting more light onto the sensor. So the ratio of light or image on that sensor to the sensor noise, the image ratio is greater. And you get a much better result when you're grading. And I think the easiest thing for me to do now is I'm going to jump into DaVinci Resolve. And I'm going to show you some examples of exactly what I'm talking about. So hopefully this will all make sense and become much clearer to you. We will have some, uh, a brief bit of time at the end for some questions and answers. Um, but I'm just going to go into Resolve, and hopefully it won't take too long to load. Here we go. And right, so I've already got some clips in a project here all set up. And OK, so first of all, some of you may have seen this before. This is a shot done with a conventional camera, uh, with conventional gamma. And just to show you really what happens when you do overexpose with conventional gamma, deliberately overexposed, everything's become very bright. The highlights, we're throwing away data in the highlights, remember? So what happens when we try and grade those highlights? If I bring the levels down by grading this, well, the highlights, the guy's forehead, the girl's face, remain very flat because we threw away a load of data in the highlights. Now, if we look at the next clip, this is the same thing shot with RAW. And again, deliberately overexposed. Now, what's going to happen with RAW, linear RAW? We haven't thrown away any highlight information. So when I bring that down in level, well, we still have nice contrast. It's a really striking difference between the way this handles and the way conventional video handles, because we are not throwing away highlight information. And that's so important, especially if you're considering doing productions for HDR and things like that in the future. Now, this next clip here, this is one stop underexposed, deliberately underexposed. And I've applied a very aggressive lookup table to this. Um, and a grade. And you can see all the noise in the shadows. And that would clearly be unusable. You couldn't use that unless you did some very aggressive noise reduction on it. The next clip is correctly exposed, but it's still noisy in the shadows because this grade that I'm doing here is really aggressive. I'm pulling the blacks down, lifting the mids, and that makes the noise really stand out. Now, when I shot this, I turned off the camera's noise reduction. The camera has built-in noise reduction to make this uh, really obvious. So how do you get around this? Well, it's actually really easy. What you do is you deliberately shoot one stop over. You deliberately overexpose. So if you're using Cine EI on the camera, the camera has a function called Cine EI, instead of shooting at the native ISO, which is 2000 on the F5 or 1250 on the 55, you would shoot at one, um, one ISO down. So 1000 ISO on the 5 and uh, 640 ISO on the 55. By having a lower ISO, it makes you open the iris. Your pictures get darker in the viewfinder, so you open the aperture by a stop. You get one more stop of light coming in onto the sensor. And as you'll see here, this is one stop overexposed. The noise is significantly reduced now for the same grade. If we go another stop further, we go two stops overexposed and have the same grade. That noise has completely gone now. It's no longer an issue. This is really nice and clean. So by deliberately overexposing, I can grade my footage much more aggressively. This is a very, very aggressive grade that I've done here. But I can hear you all saying, well, if you've overexposed, what's happened to your highlights? Because normally when you overexpose, that's a big problem. 
So let's have a look. If I bring the gain down here, this was linear raw, we can actually see what's going on in my highlights. So if I bring this way down, well, actually, you can still see the clouds in the sky. The camera is not clipped. This is what happens when you have 14 stops of dynamic range. There's so much extra dynamic range at the high end that you can afford to overexpose. You lose nothing in your highlights in most cases when you're one or two stops overexposed. If I bring that down a bit more, you can probably see you can actually see the clouds in the sky, in that sky. It is not clipped. It is not um, over overexposed. So going to the next step here. Um, let me see. OK, so this is raw, normal exposure. And if you look up here, you'll see that the normal exposure brought into Resolve with nothing done to it. No grades been applied to this. This is as it comes into Resolve now. Normal exposure, two stops over. It looks exactly the same. Why does it look the same? Because when you bring RAW in and you debayer it, in the metadata of the clip is information about the exposure. So the software in here in Resolve is automatically correcting my exposure. So the brightness that I get is the same whether I shot under or over. It normalizes it, and that makes grading really easy. Now, if we apply um, a LUT, sorry, OK. So with RAW, our brightness is the same. Now, S-Log3 normal exposure. Now, I've applied a LUT to this, and it looks good, looks fine. We go two stops over with S-Log3, exactly the same LUT, and it's overexposed. So to correct the S-Log3, I'd have to actually change my LUT. With RAW, I don't need to do that. RAW, it all happens automatically. When I'm doing it with LOG to get the same exposure, I would have to apply a LUT. Now, OK, so I have here, let me bring this up full screen. This is my normally exposed S-log. This is my two stops over S-log with the same LUT applied to both clips. Now, what happens if I try to grade this one to make it match this? I'm just going to do a simple gain change. So if I bring my level down to try and make it match, well, if I get the house, the bricks on the house matching in the mid-range, if I get the mid-range to match, you'll see that my highlight range, the sky, and also down here in the grass is quite different. So I actually have to regrade the footage to make it match. In practice, the way you would normally do this is actually use a different LUT for this, a LUT with exposure and exposure offset in it to make these match. So this is where log becomes harder to grade compared to linear raw. Linear raw wouldn't have this behavior. Linear raw, you just make a gain change. And because everything's linear, it all changes uniformly. But with log, because it's a curve, you change the highlights, you get a different, um, different change to what you get in the mid-range. So I'd actually have to fiddle around with this quite a bit. Um, let's see if we bring the highlights back up. No, nope, highlights down. Well, I'm not going to do it. It would take too long. But it's really difficult to match this. You'd have to use LUTs. Linear raw would be very easily. So I'm going to come out of Resolve and back into my slides. So other features of the camera. So linear raw, I think, is a really big thing. You can shoot HD and 2K at up to 180 frames per second compressed internally or up to 240 frames per second with linear raw. Now, many cameras can do that. That's not something that's a unique feature to the camera. But, and most cameras do this, when you take that 4K sensor and you want to go higher than 60 frames per second, and this, isn't, this is the way most cameras do this, they have to read the sensor at a lower resolution so they can get the data off the sensor fast enough. And the problem you get there is this is a 4K camera with a 4K optical filter in it. As soon as you start reading that sensor at a lower resolution, you get something called aliasing, because we're now reading the sensor at 2K instead of 4K, so there is a mismatch between the 4K filter and the way the sensor is being read. 
And this is an example here. This is aliasing from a 4K camera where the sensor is being read at 2K, either for 2K RAW or for 2K or HD high speed. So this can be a big problem, and it is a problem in many cameras. But with the F5, F55, you have the ability to change the optical filter. It takes about 20 seconds to change. You undo a little screw here. This slides out. You change it, put the 2K filter in. And then that aliasing issue goes away. So the 55 and 5 are one of the few cameras that have the ability to shoot high speed above 60 frames per second, still using the full super 35 millimeter size sensor without any additional aliasing, without any additional moiré. If you don't have the filter, well, you also have a center scan mode on the camera where instead of reading the whole sensor, you just read a 2K extract from the middle of the sensor. So in effect, it's still a 4K sensor, but you're only now, re only now reading the middle. So again, you don't get aliasing and you don't get moiré. And it's a really key and important feature. You have integrated interval record and picture cache all built into the camera. So... Um, interval record for time-lapse. You saw plenty of time-lapse examples in the video, but also a memory cache in the camera that is constantly filling up. Um, it depends on what frame rate and what resolution you're working at as to how long that memory cache is. But what it means is when I'm shooting lightning and thunderstorms, I can point the camera in the direction of the thunderstorm. I can wait for the lightning to strike, flash, press the record button, and I've got it. I haven't got to continuously roll the camera to record those lightning bolts. I can actually wait for them to happen and then press record because the few seconds before hitting the record button is, also, is dumped out of that memory cache and recorded onto my S by S or XQD cards. ENG meets Super 35 millimeter. Lots and lots of people want to have that Super 35 look, that filmic shallow depth of field look, but also shoot in an ENG style, run and gun documentary type productions. So Sony developed this shoulder rig, the CBK 55BK. I really wish Sony would come up with some nice names for their stuff. You know, um, how you're supposed to remember that, I really don't know. Anyway, it's a shoulder rig. And the interesting thing about this is it actually docks into this multi-way connector that's on the back of the camera. And when it's docked onto the camera, you get a whole bunch of extra assignable buttons. You get your normal gain, white balance switches, your shutter speed switch down here, uh, audio control on the front, white and black balance, all those controls that you'd have on a typical ENG camera right where you would normally expect them to be. You get a drop-in wireless mic receiver, audio controls on the back, four channels of analog audio in. There's only two normally on the camera. So it really does make it into an ENG camera. The balance, the weight, the positioning of the buttons is just the same as your typical ENG two-third inch type camera. You can also put a two-third inch adapter on here to use a two-third inch lens if you wish. So you really can use it as an ENG camera for ENG applications. Studio and live as well. Again, because we have this multi-connector on the back of the camera, we can dock an adapter on it. The HDC 2000, uh, CA4000 camera adapter converts it into a fully-fledged fiber uh, 4K camera. And actually, one of the quite things that I found quite surprising about this first time I saw it is actually the image quality gets better. Because what's happening here is we're taking that raw off the sensor down the fiber, and it goes to this big processing unit here, and it's debayered and decoded in here. And this has more processing power than the camera body itself. So you actually get slightly higher image quality when you use this system than if you were shooting uh, with the camera anyway. Many, many lens options on the camera. We can change that lens mount. It comes off in a matter of seconds. And you can put on just about any lens mount that you want. I use Canon lens a lot. Uh, Canon lenses a lot. Canon EF mount lenses. But you can have PL, B4, 2 3rd inch, Nikon, just about anything. There, there really is almost no lens that you can't put on this camera. 
So all of these things make this an incredibly versatile camera. Some of these features really are unique, like the uh, user-changeable optical low-pass filter, which makes the slow motion uh, really nice. Also, actually, if you're shooting in 2K, by changing that filter, you get a much more creamy, uh, slightly softer look. Um, one of the things I often see in, in presentations or demonstrations, actually, is when we look at an Arri Alexa next to an F5 or F55, is the Sony cameras look sharper. Well, that's because they are. They're higher resolution cameras. But if you don't like that sharpness, well, you can change the optical filter, and then they look very much alike. Um, and interesting, just as a little aside, we did a test on a workshop I was doing. We had an Alexa and a 55 plugged into two monitors side by side, same lenses, same setup, same everything. And there's actually a lookup table in the 55 called LC709 Type A that mimics Ari's 709 Gamma. And both cameras look more or less identical. We invited cinematographers, DOPs, to come into the room and tell us which camera was which just looking at the monitors. And there was a lot of guessing and umming and ahhing, and most people couldn't really tell. But the one comment that came out from everyone looking at the two monitors was, well, that camera's out of focus. One of the two cameras looked out of focus all the time, and that was the Alexa, because it is softer than the 5 and 55. And when you put them side by side, it just makes it look as though it's always slightly out of focus. It was quite an interesting thing to see. But anyway, if you put the 2K low-pass filter into the 55, it looks has that same soft look as the Arri Alexa. So pretty much it. Um, thank you for listening. Sony have a community for users of these cameras that I um, subscribe to. And if you have any feature requests, anything you'd like added to the camera, do post it here because it's very much a, a work in progress. These cameras are getting better and better and better. The F5 that I have now is very, very different to the one I purchased two years ago. It is a much better camera than the one I originally purchased, and that hasn't cost me any extra. So it's continuously releasing new firmware updates, adding new features, improving on things and things like that, a lot of it based on user feedback. I have my own website, xdcam-user.com, and you'll find guides on lookup tables, how to use Cine EI and things like that on there if you need to have a look at any of that sort of thing. And if you want to come storm chasing, if you fancy a bit of excitement, have a word after the presentation and uh, see if I can set you up with something perhaps. So I've got a few minutes left. So um, anybody have any questions on any aspect of the camera? Yes, sir. Can I put the Sony Alpha lenses on it? Sony Alpha lenses, yes, you can, but not Sony E-mount lenses. So the original Alpha, the same as the Minolta mount, you can get adapters to use those lenses on the camera, but you can't use the E-mount lenses on it because the flange back distance is the same. Yes, sir. I was confused when you were saying you were overexposing. Yes, OK, so yeah. No, I'm, no, I wasn't lowering the gain. So what's happening there is the camera has a mode called Cine EI mode, where it works with the lookup tables. In Cine EI, you are changing the gain of the lookup table. So what you see in the viewfinder or on your monitor gets brighter or darker depending on the EI that you're using, but the actual recording always takes place at the camera's native ISO. So the way I work with my F5 is I will normally shoot with my EI set one or two stops below the native. So on a five, native ISO is 2000. So I'm normally shooting typically at 800 EI. So that makes the pictures in the viewfinder or on the monitor dark. And as a cameraman, when you see a dark picture, what do you normally do? You open the aperture. By opening the aperture, I'm actually making the recording brighter because the recording ISO is still the native ISO. Take that into post-production. Because it's bright, you're going to bring it down in post when you grade it, and that makes all your noise go away. And it's a really good way to work. And actually, the majority of digital cinema cameras work that way and are normally ha best if they're handled that way, deliberately overexposed. Yes, sir. Well, you're making the most of your available light. Yes, absolutely. You would probably still do it. No, you would. Ev even when I have control, even in a studio environment, I'm still going to use this same method because it, it improves your signal-to-noise ratio. 
So a, se a camera sensor has a fixed amount of noise, and that doesn't change really no matter what you do. If you can make the light brighter, the scene brighter, then relative to the scene, the noise is less. If your scene is dark, then that noise is, is a large part of your picture. But if your scene is bright, that noise is only a small part of the picture. So although the camera comes out of the factory, rated at 1,250 ISO for the 55, I find it better to set my EI to 640 and use it like that, record a brighter picture, take it into post, bring those levels down a bit in post, and I have a much cleaner image, much less noise, and I can grade it much more aggressively. I mean, you don't have to do it this way. I mean, this is, this is, this is the way I do it, and this is the way a lot of cinematographers do it. But there's many, many ways to skin a cat, so choose the way that works for you. But this is, this is one way that is a, a good way to work with these cameras. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. If you're shooting in S log, then normally the camera will be shooting and recording at its fixed base ISO. So the recording will be at 1250 ISO on the 55 or 2000 on the 5, and that doesn't change always. Then you turn on your LUTs, your lookup tables, and the EI changes the gain of the lookup table. Doesn't affect the recording at all. It's just changing the LUT of the lookup table makes the lookup table brighter or darker, and then that makes you, when you look in the viewfinder, change your exposure. Because if the picture's too bright, because the LUT has been made brighter, you will tend to then close the iris on the camera. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a, if, you're not, if you haven't done it before, it's very confusing, because it's all a bit back to front to the way we normally work as a traditional, as a traditional cameraman. But it's, also, it, but it's the way you would have worked with film. It's the way a film camera, cameraman would typically have worked. So you buy a 200 ISO film stock, but the film cameraman would set his light meter to 100 ISO, so the, the light meter's going to basically force him then to be overexposing his film. It's this, exactly the same technique. So if you're having to do a two crossover to get adequate noise, what about when there's not a, not a, like at night time, when you don't, when you don't have control over getting adequate noise? Yeah. Well, generally speaking, I will use a lower ISO because if I'm shooting outside, I mean, the camera's very sensitive anyway. I mean, the F5 in particular, 2000 ISO, it's an incredibly sensitive camera, and actually sometimes that can be a bit of a, a burden because it's too sensitive. So it's actually nice just to rate it at 800 anyway, just to bring that, effectively bring that sensitivity down. At night in a low light scene, well, if you haven't got enough light, you just have to shoot at the base ISO. Um, again, the reality is that gain, uh, so with a traditional video camera, there's, X amount of noise, so you have this fixed amount of noise that comes from a sensor. And you shoot at night, and typically what most people do is, because the picture's too dark, they add a whole load of extra gain. It does not make the camera more sensitive. All it does is make the picture brighter. And a byproduct of making the picture brighter is you get more noise. So you have two options. You shoot at the standard ISO, record the very high quality recording, and then you add your gain in post by adding the gain, or you no longer use the EI mode. You go into custom mode on the camera where you can actually add gain. In custom mode, the camera, you can actually physically add gain in the camera. Again, either way, whether you shoot at the native ISO and add the gain in post, or whether you shoot and you raise the gain in the camera in custom mode, either way, you'll end up with more noise. It's just a, it's a case of whether you do it in post or in camera. Generally, I prefer to do it in post because you can be selective where you add the gain. So in post-production, you can take your mid-range and add the bit of, bit of gain to the mids, but leave the shadows alone so they stay relatively noise-free. You can't do that in the camera. So you have to sort of, I mean, this is where sort of getting to know the camera if, uh, really well really helps because then you start knowing which modes are best to use for different situations. Any more questions? Yes. How does the FS7 work into this world? Okay, so how does the FS7 work into this world? Right, so FS7 does the majority of what the F5 can do. Um, the, and it's a great camera, the FS7. It really is. I, I have one as well, and, and it's, it's a slightly different camera. F5, F55 ergonomically, I believe, are far superior to the FS7. Better viewfinders, things like that. The side panel display shows you what lookup tables you've got and things like that. So it's an easier camera to work with. 
the raw on the FS7 is 12-bit or 14-bit? I can't remember. It's slipped my mind now. F55 is 16-bit, and the FS7, um, I think, is 14-bit. And that does make a big difference to the raw. And what it means in the FS7, the raw from the FS7, bizarrely, has less information in the shadows. So with raw, because you, you go you have 2 bits, 4 bits, 8 bits, 16 bits, so on, when you don't have enough bits, it's actually the shadows that end up suffering because you have to reduce the number of bits in the shadows to have enough bits to record the highlights. So when you don't have enough bits with your RAW, it's the shadows that suffer. And what I find with the FS7 shooting the RAW, the RAW is still exceptionally good. It's really good, but there just isn't as much information in the shadows. So if you've got to do anything with really dark or deep shadows, it can be a little bit problematic. Sometimes you can get a bit of banding in the, in the deep shadows. Oh, yeah, absolutely. These are definitely superior cameras to the FS7, no doubt about that. But the FS7 is an incredibly capable camera. I mean, bang for the buck, the FS7 is really amazing. You get a hell of a camera for the money. And it can do most of what this can do. The other limitation with the FS7 is you can't change the optical filter. And uh, currently, the high speed is all using the full frame sensor. So there is some wire and aliasing at high speed. But that is going to change because there will be a crop mode introduced to the FS7 uh, in a later firmware update. Okay, uh, one more quick question. Yeah. Are there any disadvantages to doing shooting uh, 4K but then doing like a full, like doing 2K raw? Are there any disadvantages to doing 2K raw? So, yeah, um, I, I would never, deli unless there was some really strong reason for it, I would never shoot 2K raw. First thing to consider is it's raw, so it's going to be debayed to go to HD if you're going to do HD. So when you debayer, you don't get the full resolution that you've shot at. You get about 80% of it. So if you're shooting in 2K, you're going to end up with your, final, your actual resolution being about 1.6K, slightly lower than HD. So 2K RAW is a bit of an oddity, really, because it doesn't, really, it doesn't even give you HD resolution by the time it's been processed and debayered. I would much rather shoot in 4K and then process that down to HD. You've got the ability to crop into the image if you need to, to do image stabilization with no loss of quality. Lots of benefits to doing that over shooting in 2K RAW. Anyway, um, very quickly. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think they are a pair of 4K projectors because I believe a lot of the footage that you were seeing before was shot with the F65, which has an 8K sensor and processed at 8K and then being split to the two 4K projectors to give you an 8K image. I, I think. I'm not entirely sure. I think that's what's happening there. Yeah, yes, it is. Great. Fantastic. So there we go. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for listening. And enjoy the rest of the show.